I took this new ARM motherboard bundle from ASRock Rack and installed it in the HL15 server chassis. I put Rocky Linux on it, ran some tests, and the thing sucked down like 150 watts. That's a lot more than I expected, especially since ARM's supposed to be more efficient than Intel and AMD, right? I asked Techno Tim what his server was using with the standard Intel Xeon CPU, and it only used like 80 watts at idle. So what gives? Well, in this video, I'm gonna deep dive into the efficiency of this system, talk about why I actually switched from Rocky Linux to Ubuntu, and show how I fixed the most annoying problem, the noisy server fans. I mentioned last video, most people would do just fine with a less expensive NAS that uses a lot less power. But if you need more I.O., or if you want to explore more exotic hardware, this system is great for learning. Especially if you do any work with ARM, whether that's for software development, deploying to ARM in the cloud, or whatever. But let's get started with my favorite upgrade on the server, the Noctua fan swap. After that last video where I showed off Noctua's new Ampere CPU coolers, the Noctua rep told me he had just the solution for the loud case fans. Noctua fans, of course. <laughs> Lots of them. He sent over six of their premium 120 millimeter fans with all the bells and whistles. He also sent a fan hub and these interesting little rings. Apparently, when you have obstructions like these 45 drives grills on the front of the chassis, if you pop these spacers on the fans, it reduces the amount of noise through the grills. I can't even begin to explain the physics, but the end result was the fans are literally inaudible in the rack, so I guess they work. When I first booted up the HL15, even without any hard drives, the Cooler Guys fans that were included were about 60 decibels at a foot away. Yeah, it's definitely not silent. It's, uh, it's not loud like an Enterprise piece of gear, but it's not silent. Let's put the cover on. This server's meant for home labs, where you might run this thing under your desk or even in a bedroom closet. And in those situations, fans that loud aren't very nice. I mean, some people do run used 1U servers with screeching loud server fans, but for most of us, we appreciate quiet. You'd think for an $800 chassis, 45 drives could include quieter fans out of the box, but at a retail price of around 200 bucks, I can see why it's not quite as simple as just choosing Noctua when you're an OEM. And before I sound like I'm hating on the OEM fans, they could be quieter, but the HL15 only passes through 12 volts to each fan, so out of the box you can't get them to run any slower, so you're stuck with that loud fan noise no matter what. The nicest thing about the way the HL15 is set up is a fan swap is almost trivially easy. They have a front panel that comes off exposing the front three fans, and a fan tray in the middle that's easy to pop out. All the fans have plenty of clearance, and there's a lot of room for add-ons, like a fan hub. Now, I was planning on using the 12 volt SATA power input on Noxua's fan hub so I could run all six fans off it, but I realized all the SATA connectors on the power supply were hooked up to the HL15's custom power distribution board over here. So I nixed that idea and plugged three fans through the fan hub, then the other three through a three-way fan power splitter Noxua sent. This should work with most motherboards, but check your motherboard specs to make sure you're not overloading a fan header. Anyway, after admiring my OnlyFans desk setup for a few minutes, I put in the new Noctuas and spent a few minutes routing the cables around somewhat nicely. I also taped off all the old fan connectors with electrical tape since they exposed 12 volts and ground on their bare pins, and I didn't want anything to get shorted out. You could pull these wires completely, but you'd have to rewire an ATX header for that, and I'm just too lazy. I put all the fans back in, and I had the fan inlet spacers on the front, but not on the middle section, since that section has a full-size cutout and no obstructions. Then I booted the server to see how the sound compared. It was absolutely night and day. I mean, not only are the Noxua's quieter at full blast, but with PWM control, meaning the fans don't spin up unless things get hot, they're almost silent. 34 decibels in the studio, where the noise floor is around 33. Compare that to the 60 decibels I was getting on the old fans. And you know what's crazy? I still heard a tiny bit of fan noise. Eventually, I realized it was the PSU fan way in the back. It's actually the loudest part of this whole system now. And maybe I'll do a fan swap on the power supply, but I might also just upgrade to one that's more efficient. I might shave off a few extra watts with a better PSU. But besides being quieter, something else I learned was the Cooler Guys fans uses a little more power than the Noxua's, especially running 100% all the time. I went through a gauntlet of tests to try to isolate each part of the system and check its power draw. And to kick things off, when I did my initial tests with the kilowatt in the studio, it was showing over 150 watts. 
The server must have still been doing something when I took that measurement, though, because later, after I finished editing that video, I checked again, and it was 123 watts. Still a bit higher than I was hoping, though. This dashboard I'm using, I set up in Home Assistant, taking readings from a third reality Zigbee power measurement outlet. But I started taking out one thing after another to check how much power each device consumed. I pulled the four Samsung QVO SSDs, and that was down to 119 watts, so about one watt each at idle. Then I pulled the six Seagate Exos hard drives, and that was down to 82 watts. That means each drive uses about six watts at idle. Then I pulled the HBA card that plugs all the hard drives into the motherboard. That thing uses 16 watts, apparently, meaning so far it's by far the biggest power consumer on this whole system. And at this point, if you take out the storage completely, we're down to 66 watts. Next, I pulled out two sticks of RAM, so I went from 64 to 32 gigs of RAM, and that brought it down to 61 watts. Each stick used maybe 3 watts. Then I unplugged the three intake fans on the front, and those things sucked down about 2 watts each, so just the fans eat up 12 watts of power the way the HL15's built out of the factory. And if I unplugged one of the Noctua CPU cooler fans, it was negligible. My testing still showed 56 watts total power draw, just like before. What did have an effect was unplugging the 10 gig Ethernet from the back, but that was only 2 watts. Definitely not worth a downgrade to 1 gig networking. But at this point, I had a bunch of test data, and a pretty good idea of where all that idle power was going. And I didn't isolate all the way down to the CPU level, but that's only because I can measure CPU power through the motherboard. Using sensors, it looks like the 32-core Ampere uses about 9 watts at idle, so not bad at all for a beefy server CPU. So now that I had an idea of how much power every component used, I had some actual data to back up any efficiency claims. And that's also where things get harder. Because what is efficiency? Is it efficient if you have a CPU that idles at 1 watt, but your workload pegs it to 80 to 100% all day? Or is it efficient if you have a CPU that always stays around 30 watts, but you can perform better than that first CPU at max throttle using the same amount of power? The answer? It's complicated. For home labs especially, every workload's a bit different. For most of us, though, I'd say idle power is pretty important. Most of our home labs aren't mining Bitcoin, transcoding video 24-7, or training large language models for AI. There are exceptions, and I know some of you will point that out, but idle power is my baseline. If you have to pay a lot for electricity, lower idle power equates to real savings over the course of a year, much less a decade. So efficiency. It's complicated, and it can mean something different for different people. Besides idle power, though, one way to quantitatively measure efficiency is to push a CPU to its limit and check how much work it can do per watt. And in my case, my favorite test is the Top 500 Supercomputer Benchmark, High Performance Linpack. I have a project that runs it across almost any hardware that can run Linux, even inside a container, and I've been tracking the most efficient hardware I've tested. Does the Q32 CPU in here come close? Well, again, it's complicated. If I strip down the system to just the motherboard, a boot SSD, and RAM, then I can hit pretty amazing efficiency numbers. But the great thing about this overall system is I can still hit numbers like 2 to 3 gigaflops per watt fully kitted out. If I pull out the storage devices, I can get 3.32 gigaflops per watt. That means on this system, it can give me 332 gigaflops of compute power running at about 100 watts from the wall. The CPU only draws about 30 to 35. And to get to that high benchmark, I also installed a full 8 sticks of RAM. So that does use a little more power and uses more RAM, which of course adds to cost. And really quick, just as a note, the Noxua CPU cooler did a great job keeping the thing cool. It never got above 43 degrees. But after all that, is this server efficient? Yes. Is this as efficient for home use as a little NAS appliance running at 10 or 20 watts all in? Probably not. But that all assumes you don't need the massive expansion an Ampere CPU and a server motherboard give you. It all depends on what you need and your own goals. But efficiency means nothing if you can't even get the software running that you need. And for me, well, I did run into some issues running ARM instead of x86. I had installed Rocky Linux last video, and I was automating the whole build with Ansible. That was going fine. And I already knew software like TrueNAS and Unraid aren't built for ARM yet, but that's really their loss. I was planning on configuring this by hand anyway. But I did want to see if I could get 45 drives software running. My goal was to install Houston, their customized cockpit setup that adds a web UI to their servers, giving me control over storage and file sharing. But that's where I started running into some problems. I was creating an Ansible playbook to automate the setup of everything, and I had added some of the steps recommended by 45 drives, like disabling SE Linux, setting up the Apple repository, and installing 45 drives cockpit packages. But I started to run into problems when I tried setting up 45 drives package repository. 
no matter, I still got Cockpit installed without the extra 45 drive stuff, and it's a pretty cool set of web UI tools that let me see everything going on inside the server from my browser. But the problem was, I couldn't configure Samba or ZFS in that UI without 45 drive's packages. Eventually, I found out the repos only have packaging built for x86, not ARM64. And even after a decade or so of ARM being on the desktop and in server markets, there are a lot of software packages that are like that. In some cases, you can compile the software yourself from sources. It's annoying, but I do that sometimes. And that's actually the only way to get ZFS running at all right now on Red Hat derivative systems like Rocky Linux. But in 45 Drive's case, their smaller development team doesn't currently have instructions for ARM, so unless I wanted to spend days building my own packaging for it, I'd have to give up on Houston and Cockpit, for now at least. So that's what I did. Now, Ubuntu seems to have much better universal ARM support, and they even include ZFS packages that work with ARM by default. So I popped into the BMC and installed Ubuntu on the server, writing over the Rocky Linux install. I rebuilt my Ansible playbook to set up my security best practices, then added some tasks to set up ZFS. Then, just to test it all worked, I created a test pool using just the hard drives, and it worked right away. So I spent a little time automating the ZFS stuff in Ansible, and I made sure to use the disk identifiers instead of just the device names like SDA and SDB, so ZFS could easily correlate the drives to their serial numbers. This video isn't a deep dive into ZFS by any means. Go check out Techno Tim, Hardware Haven, Lawrence Systems, or one of the other great home lab YouTubers for that. But I'm using ZFS here because it gives better data resilience, easy setup, and convenient features for managing shares than pretty much any other Linux file system. But now my goal is to figure out the best way to use these six 20 terabyte hard drives and these four 8 terabyte SSDs. And the only way to know for sure is to benchmark. Now, benchmarking anything for a general audience is a fool's game. I know this. Benchmarking a few basic use cases for my own needs is still hard, but at least it's doable. So in my case, I wanted to monitor power consumption, noise, and data transfer speed for two types of use cases, one megabyte block size large file copies and 4K small file copies. I do a ton of video editing, and a lot of video files are gigabytes in size. But while editing, the files that describe the edit are usually a few kilobytes each, like thumbnail caches and stuff like that. Regardless, like I said, these two scenarios are not representative of your usage. So if you go to benchmark your own stuff, spend some time thinking about ways to make the benchmarks meaningful for you. And all that out of the way, I set up a script to run the benchmarks using a tool called IOZone. FIO is also a good tool, but I like the simplicity of IOZone sometimes. And again, I monitored power consumption with this smart outlet and disk IO with ZFS's built-in IO stat monitor. I also kept checking on the ARC cache status. That's the caching built into ZFS to make things faster. And I listened to what the hard drives were doing with my ears. And on that note, I'm really glad I did the Noxua swap because when I hit the entire array with a lot of random IO, I can actually hear the drives doing work now. I tested a few different scenarios just to see what would happen, and I learned some interesting things about ZFS performance. First, I tested just a RAID Z2 array of these six hard drives. This lets me have up to two hard drive failures and should still be decently fast. And it is. I can get over 600 megabytes per second read and write with this for large files like videos. And that's plenty, but though not quite enough to saturate a 10 gig connection. If I added on a second VDEV, I could probably get a full 10 gig transfer rate, but I'll put that off until I need the capacity. Random reads and writes aren't half bad either, coming in over 100 megabytes per second. And for these tests, I was using a 128 gigabyte dataset, which is double the size of the ARC allocation in RAM. If you use less than what ZFS can do in your RAM, your results will just show your RAM speed, and that's not all that useful here. But I also tested using two SSDs mirrored for a slog, or a ZFS intent log external to the main hard drive array. This actually made things slower. A, a lot slower, and that's because these SSDs are still just slow SATA SSDs, not fast NVMe drives or Intel Optane drives. Worse yet, they only really sped up sequential write when I added a special option to IOZone to force sequential I.O. <laughs> and even worse, again, the two mirrored SSDs were actually bottlenecking the hard drive, so power consumption got really spiky, and you could even hear how the hard drives would sit and do nothing, then go crazy, then sit again. So a slog could be useful if you have small but faster SSDs, but only in certain cases. It's not true that just throwing SSDs in arrays makes things faster. You always have to benchmark and test your assumptions. Next up, I tried adding what's called an L2 arc, or basically a layer 2 cache behind the RAM but in front of the hard drives. In this case, I let ZFS stripe together all four SSDs. 
And this was a mixed bag. It, it did speed up random reads a little, but L2ARC seems like it would mostly be helpful with read-heavy workloads where you have more data than you can fit in half your RAM. I think the advice I read on some forums applies here. First, focus on maxing out the RAM in your server if you want ZFS to be the fastest. Then focus on other things. But to round it all out, I also tested with a mirrored VDEV pool on the four SSDs. This is basically ZFS's version of a RAID 10, where you stripe two mirrored drives together. You could only get half the raw capacity and either one or two hard drive failures before the data's gone, but it should be a little faster than a RAID Z2. And it was. A lot faster, in fact, for sequential access, at least. Read speeds can finally fill up my 10 gig pipe, and write is almost there. And random writes are pretty good still, but I'm guessing the consumer QVO SSDs I'm using just can't pump through data as fast as a modern NVMe drive. At least that's my theory, my home lab theory. These tests all helped me learn about ZFS's performance and about how different types of drives affect it. I'm probably gonna add on an M.2 expansion card at some point and retest the caching and slog stuff, but that's the joy of having home lab style servers, at least for me. It's fun to experiment with this stuff. But I'll probably leave some of that experimentation for after I get replication and an offsite backup working, because this machine is now my main NAS storing all my critical data. Right now, at least, it's my only live copy of all my video data, and I back it up every week manually. That's not great, so I hope I can get another server running where I'll replicate all the data from this one. Will that be a Raspberry Pi? Something else? I don't know. But I do know that one thing I love about all this work is it keeps my mind sharp. And you know what else keeps my mind sharp? Brilliant. They're sponsoring this video, and they're not just for math and science. I signed up and found a bunch of computer science courses. I learned Python the hard way, just testing and breaking things. That's not the worst way to learn, of course, but Brilliant covers a ton of Python, from beginner level up to algorithms and data structures. Their courses could help you advance your career. Or if you're like me, you can brush up on things you never got to learn in school. I was checking out the Python course, and look at that. They're actually running code samples on a server in the cloud. What fun could we have? Well, you'll find out if you sign up. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash jeffgearling or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.